Hello and welcome to Kind Voice Radio. I'm your host, David Levinson. And a few weeks ago, we had Carrie Rydell on of Bookopolis, who had this really innovative website to get children and books connected and talking about books. But before children can get interested in all the kind voices and books, they have to learn to read. So enter our guest today, Mark Hecker, who's doing an innovative and bold program in the Washington, D.C. area. It's, it's called REACH, that connects elementary school students with teen tutors and really brings out a lot of good things in both. So thrilled to have Mark on. Welcome to the program, Mark. Thanks so much for having me. Good deal. Can, can you tell the folks a little bit about what REACH does? Sure. So REACH uh, started as an after-school program where we train and hire struggling high school students to be elementary school literacy tutors. So Twice a week, we train our tutors on how to create lesson plans and, and engage young students. And twice a week, they work one-on-one -on -one with second and third graders at a nearby elementary school. Uh, a couple years after we started, um, some of our teens felt that the stories they were using in their tutoring weren't very reflective of their lives. So since then, we've also added a second component where our teen tutors actually author books as well. And, and with our Partners at a group called Shout Mouse Press, we've now published 17 children's books written by teenagers uh, wow. working in our program. So um, through the program, both the teen tutors and their elementary school students experience pretty significant reading growth. Uh, and we feel like for the tutors, it's also an experience where they develop leadership skills and, and become more engaged in their own education. Wow. And, and this is such a cool program, and it seems to be 50% about the tutor and 50% about the tutoree. Is that, that an accurate statement that you want to help both groups? We, cer we certainly want to help most groups. Uh, and, and just for ease of language, we always refer to the high school kids as tutors and the elementary school kids as students. Um, oh, okay. So it's, it's an easy, better, easy way to remember term. one versus the other. Uh, but yeah, I, the way we often talk about it is that our, our primary client is the high school tutor. Uh, and the program we run is the program they run is aimed at elementary school students. So um, what makes our model unique certainly is that both groups benefit. Um, but I think part of what makes us really unique uh, is our ability to create significant reading growth at the high school level, which is um, not something that uh, many people find success with. But yeah, the, the we hear from a lot of people that they, they like the two birds, one stone aspect of what we do. And what was the spark that started this journey? So my background is actually that I, I started my career as a social worker in the child welfare system. And, and in the District of Columbia, uh, the social worker actually becomes the legal guardian for the child. Um, so I was the one that was at all the IEP meetings, all the school meetings, anytime my kids got in trouble at school. Um, so it was a very interesting look into the education system. Um, and what I found over and over again were kids that had experienced trauma, had had a rough upbringing, um, they get off track in school, and that schools are not really built to, to catch them up. Um, so they sometimes provide social supports. They sometimes track them in different subjects or pathways toward graduation. Um, but there wasn't a lot of work happening in high school to try to actually close the gap that had been created due to that trauma. Uh, and that sort of, you know, solving that problem sort of became my obsession because I knew plenty of young people that were smart and capable and and were demonstrating maturity in many, many ways, but were reading at an elementary school level. Um, and I felt like the way to address that was actually by giving them more responsibility rather than trying to protect them from it. So is the first group of people you're trying to engage the tutors yeah, that's, cer that's certainly where we go first. Um, so we, we recruit our tutors and, and do some pre-service training with them before they ever meet their students. Um, and we're really trying to get them to see themselves as leaders and, and assets in their community. Um, and, you know, the second and third graders get so excited about spending time with big kids uh, that it's sort of hard to keep up. You know, a lot of teenagers put up sort of a rough outside exterior for any number of reasons, but it's really hard to keep that up when there's a seven-year-old that comes and gives you a hug at the beginning of every session. <laughs> um, so we feel like it, it creates, you know, a, 
a level of comfort, it creates, uh, it allows some vulnerability that allows for learning to happen. And, you know, obviously in, in your work, you talk a lot about the importance of kindness um, and, and kids tend to be kind to bigger kids. And, and I think that sort of raw positivity is a really positive influence on the tutors and allows them to then grow to be great leaders for us. Well, and, and kindness is a commodity, but it really has to adhere to something specific. And, and what you're doing is beautiful. I'm, I'm very curious on the steps on onboarding a tutor from the time you meet them. What is the interview process like? And, and how do you mm-hmm. onboard them to, to become a tutor? Yeah, so what's, what's a little unique about what we do is that we're actually looking for the kids. You know, we hire the kids that we think need significant support. So um, a lot of people find it sort of funny that if we get an application from a tutor that is already on honor roll and, you know, thriving in school, that tutor is, is unlikely to get the job. Uh, you're much more likely to get the job if you're really struggling in school, um, you don't really belong in any clubs, you're on that path toward potentially dropping out. Um, we'll then extend a job offer to you. Uh, you get invited to our pre-service training, which is your first week where we teach you the rules of the program. Uh, we talk a little bit about the core components of developing literacy skills. Um, there are five of them that we base our program off of, phonics, phonemic awareness, fluency, vocabulary, and text comprehension. Um, and then about a week later is the first day that you're walking down to the elementary school with, you know, our, our motto is cohort-based, so you're walking down there with 20 other high school students um, to meet 20 second and third graders who are excited to work with you. So at the beginning, our curriculum is pretty prescriptive. Um, so the tutors sort of have an instruction manual on exactly what they're supposed to be doing and what activities and um, how they're supposed to be working with their kids. But as the year goes, they get more and more freedom uh, to design some components of those lessons themselves and, and to bring their own personality into the sessions. Wow, and that is such a surprising and innovative approach to, to hire those who aren't at the top top of the grade to, to be tutors. Is there a selling process involved in, in kind of building up the self-esteem of the tutor to let them know they're good enough to do this? Um, there is. I mean, I, I think that's something that takes time uh, you know, a- as you said, because the tutors themselves are one of the, you know, they're they're one of the customers for our our model. Um, we know that they're going to grow over the course of the year too. So, you know, they're not necessarily entirely confident and excited on day one of the program. A lot of our tutors are actually very nervous in the beginning. Um, you know, not all of them will admit that, but they're they're very concerned about. Um, you know, whether their student will like them, whether they'll be able to be a good teacher, things like that. And and I think what they see over time is they see um, the the almost unconditional acceptance offered to them by their students. Um, they see the unconditional support and, and positivity that my staff and team brings to the program. Um, and I think that helps them to grow as leaders. They start to understand the impact they have on kids. Um, we start seeing the how much the kids improve and we're able to share even even at stuff as granular as as reading assessment data that we'll share with the tutors just to show them how much of an impact they're having. And you know, with each successful session, with each day that their students really excited to see them, on each day that the tutor is able to engage the student in a way that even the surrounding adults can't. Um, that confidence and self-esteem grows because they really see themselves as as contributing significantly um, to their community, to their school community, um, and often they have not been the ones seen as contributors before. Uh, so it begins to alter how they see themselves. Um, I think it's a it is a process that requires patience. Uh, we really, you know, the tutors that we hire in ninth and tenth grade typically stay with us anywhere from two to four years till their till their high school graduation. Wow. Um, and because we invest so deeply in the relationship, uh, we get to see that growth happen over time. Uh, it must be a beautiful thing to see. Now, I could see where one's confidence would build doing this and with the feedback of success and love from the elementary school students. But that first step in the process when a teenager is scared, how do you mm-hmm. differentiate between those who are able to take that first step and those who you think would be overwhelmed by the fear and, and wouldn't be able to take that first step. Is there a way to differentiate? Uh, it's it's honestly not something we try to do. So when we offer a position 
to someone uh, to be a tutor in our program, we consider that we've made an unconditional commitment to them. So to, to reframe your question a little bit, it, it's my and my team's job to figure out how to help that kid take that step. Um, and for some of our tutors, that means at the beginning of their time that there's an adult sitting with them and, and helping them every step of the way. That sometimes means that we're pairing them with a more uh, experienced tutor who who can bring um, some of that sort of confidence, previously developed confidence to a session and sort of show them the ropes. Um, some kids just need some time to figure it out. But um, we we do not kick kids out of our program. We don't fire kids and, and we you know, we jokingly talk about being stalkers, but it's really hard (laughs) to quit on us too. You know, if the kid stops coming, we will go looking for them and we'll call their house and we'll show up at their house and we'll try to get them back. Um, Because we really feel that we've made a commitment to them and to their future and to their growth. So it's our job to figure out how to support them so that they can continue taking steps forward. And that's a beautiful thing. What that unconditional commitment on your side. Mm-hmm. But in the initial interview process, there must be some things that you see in a candidate that makes you guys willing to make that unconditional commitment. Uh, so we, we don't actually interview every candidate. Mostly it's through a written application and, and working with our school partners to identify the tutors that join our program. But but I'd say, no, we we actually look for the challenges. Um, we look for the kids that we think will really struggle, that, that need us, that need a family and a community to succeed. Um, and basically, as long as they're willing to make a commitment to show up, uh, we're willing to commit to them to, to support them in becoming a, a good leader and good tutor. And um, that certainly doesn't mean that every tutor becomes great. And that certainly doesn't mean that every tutor that does become great becomes great in the same way. Uh, we have, we have plenty of young people. We have plenty of young people that really, um, you know, bring out different personalities that might not act in the way I would act as a tutor. Uh, they may be a little rougher around the edges or that may um, be a little bit more of a jokester, but what we find over and over is that they bring things that allow them to connect to different students in different ways. Uh, and, and that combination of personalities creates a community where, where we're able to make a real difference in, in reading ability. I'm smiling as you're talking. Cause what you're saying is amazing, and it's more amazing than I expected. Um, now, it seems quite of what you're doing is building trust and self-esteem, and the reading is kind of teaching kids how to read is, is an application of that, but the DNA of what you do is is finding ways to build trust and and make your tutors feel good. Is that accurate? Yeah, I'd say, I mean, uh, trust and love are words that we use a lot at REACH. Um, And often in today's sort of education systems and and settings, those aren't, you know, you hear words like accountability and and instruction and rigor, which are all important things. Um, But kids grow when they feel loved and supported and and held. And in the communities where we work, um, that is not always the case for every kid we meet. So building trust, and and getting kids to um, be able to take an accurate view on what they have to offer to the world um, is a hugely important first step. You know, we we use reading as a tool through which we prepare community leaders. Um, the reading outcomes are hugely important. Reading is you know fundamental to success in our society. It just if you can't read, you're not going to be able to contribute in all the ways we want you to be able to contribute. Um, but if you're a reader, that doesn't mean you're going to be the type of person that will contribute anyway. And so we, through our model, really try to address both of those um, by building a, a trust, as you put it, and certainly by making the teens feel good about themselves, but also, you know, challenging them, making them feel uncomfortable, supporting them to persist through that discomfort, um, and really playing a role where we create the container where they feel confident, comfortable enough to, to challenge themselves to continue taking steps forward in their life. And, um, you know, there there are times where it feels like the reading is secondary, but it's also, it continues to be core to our mission and, and our outcomes there are a big part of what allow us to do the work. So it is really a combination, but I'd say love and, and trust are very central to the relationships we build and, and building relationships is what allows us to do the work. Well, it sounds like you got the right core ingredients and you're creating something beautiful. Uh, 
sometimes to do relationships ex- of the tutor and the student that extend beyond the tutor in session? Does it sometimes become like a big brother and big sister kind of relationship? Uh, it certainly does sometimes. We we for you know we still live in a society that is risk averse and litigious. So we we are very clear at the beginning of the year to the parents on both sides that you know we are supervising their relationship during our sessions. Um, anything that goes on outside of sessions um, is really at their discretion and up to them. Um, and what we see is that the communities that we serve are relatively small. So it's very common that the sibling of one of our tutors may be one of our students um, or that kids are cousins or aunts and uncles or live in the same building or their parents are friends or any sort of thing like that where um, our tutors have the opportunity to be role models not only in our sessions but beyond them as well. Uh, so we we like that opportunity. We like that that happens a lot of the time. Um, and, and there are relationships that become very important. It's it's actually pretty common for us at the end of the year um, for our final session to end with a lot of tears. I think the, the relationships do grow to matter a lot to both the tutors and the students. Um, and sometimes that's just because our two hour-long sessions a week are some of the students' favorite times. Um, you know, that's their favorite part of the school day. Uh, but sometimes it's because the relationship has taken on greater meaning and extended beyond the session. And, and we're always proud to see relationships organically grow so that, you know, no kid can ever feel too loved. Um, so we're, we're always wow. happy when, when those relationships continue to grow. It is a very beautiful thing you do. And we, we need to take our first break. So we'll be right back after this message. Is one that we believe When we reach out to each other You know we both receive Hi, I'm Bruce Crammell One of the original hosts on A Kind Voice Radio My song, The Alchemy of Kindness Is about the good things that happen When kind voices come together What you're about to hear is a message from Claire Bloom Who is using her kind voice to feed hungry children We hope that you'll help Claire with her mission and make our world a kinder, more connected place, one act at a time. Hi, I'm Claire Bloom. In 2011, I started N68 Hours of Hunger in an effort to overcome childhood hunger right here in America. There are more than 16 million children in America who are hungry between the free lunch they get in school on Friday and the free breakfast they get in school on Monday. And what we know is that if we feed these children on the weekend, they can achieve 50% higher reading scores, 30% higher math scores, and are twice as likely to successfully complete the third grade, which is a primary indicator of high school graduation. To find out more, I'd love for you to be in contact with me. We have a website at www.n68hoursofhunger.org, or you can email me directly at n68hoursofhunger at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. A Kind Voice Radio. And welcome back to Kind Voice Radio. I'm David Levinson. We're here talking with Mark Hecker, the executive director of REACH, a, a group that creates uh, tutoring relationships between elementary school students and high school students. Mark, welcome back to the program. Thanks. I'm excited to keep talking. Good good deal. Now, I know you have a music, musical background. You were part of the pitch books when, when you were at Duke University. Is that correct? That is correct. Good, good deal. Now, do you feel like the tutoring sessions and what you're doing makes a kind of music? Is there any musical connection between it? Uh, uh, I think there's certainly aspects that, that are similar in some ways. Um, I it's it's actually funny you bring this up because I I recently not too long ago read a book on leadership called Maestro um, given to me by the chair of Reach's board of directors uh, that sort of talks about how running an organization is, is can be similar to to leading an orchestra um, I think there's there's a, a lot there are a lot of similarities between what happens in a successful music group and what happens in some of our sessions but I think what stands out most to me most to me is um, the idea of sort of multiple pieces operating in parallel that any one of them alone 
doesn't get you where you need to go. It doesn't get the job done. It's only when they actually work in concert um, that you you create something that's that's truly special. And um, you know, the, for those of us that have been with Reach for a while, you sometimes walk into our sessions, and and for a stranger walking into the room, it can seem a little chaotic. There are people all over the place. Uh, there's no indication that they're all actually doing the same thing. Some are splayed out on the floor. Some are sitting at desks. Some are standing at windows. Um, but I think for me, there is there is a, something music-like in the quality that I can see the way all those pieces fit together, and I understand how um, they they create something that I find to be truly beautiful. And uh, so I, I can see some similarities in that way for sure. Now, now in music, when you're up on stage, someone may sing a wrong note or play an instrument wrong, but the song has to continue. There's a certain dynamic to it. In a tutoring Mm -hmm. session, I would guess in the initial ones, things don't always initially go right, and part of it is is correcting. Can can you talk about when things don't go right, how you correct and make them right? Yeah, I think... um... It, it depends sort of on, on the level or, or where in the group we, we have an issue. But um, I'd say on almost any day at one of our sites, there is there is some member of our group, either a tutor or a student, um, who is having a bad day, who is struggling in some way. Um, so I think it's, it's very typical that we correct by sort of um, looking to each other and, and leaning on each other to step up in difficult ways. And sometimes that means a tutor is willing to work with two or three kids instead of one. Um, sometimes that means we give a tutor or student some time just to step away from the group and, and either talk to someone or, or just take some time to themselves. But um, that part of being in a strong community is the idea that we can lean on each other and, and someone will step up and and make that better um, if someone someone else sort of falls back. Uh, I'd say more generally, if we have what might be described as a bad session, if we have an, a time when many of our tutors are not on track or not handling things in the right way, or um, the students come in and have had a particularly challenging day and are and their behavior is not on its best, um, we really look to the tutors to to step up and take leadership in those moments. And sometimes that means calling everyone together and and asking some of our leaders. Um, to, to speak to their peers and, and be better. Um, sometimes it involves, depending on our adult staff members, our program instructors, to, to remind the tutors of their job and to remind them of the, the great honor and responsibility that comes from being a role model and, and what you need to do to step into that role on a daily basis. Um, but I think what what's a little unique about REACH uh, is because we don't give up on kids that we really look at that as a process and and we understand that people are going to have good and bad days and and how you acted yesterday is not necessarily going to reflect uh, in my expectations of you today that um, we expect that people are going to encounter problems we also expect that people are going to deal with them and and therefore the fact that you might have gotten really negative yesterday uh, is not going to change how I greet you and how I set expectations the next day. And I think that expectation, that idea that you always have the chance to reset and start over has, has been very valuable culturally and allows us to, to get back on track rather easily. Wow. And you, said, you said a lot in your answer. And in a video on your website, I think Rashawn talks about stepping up his game. And that that seems to be a recurring theme of you guys were so long that would kind of be like a chorus in the song you're creating. Is, is that one of the core, core ideas about stepping up and always moving up? Yeah, I, I really think it is that, um, you know, we often sort of reflect challenges back on our tutors and ask them how they're going to, um, how they're going to address them. And I think um, our tutors end up taking that very seriously. Uh, they end up taking that responsibility seriously. And, you know, Rashawn's a great example of someone who had a particularly difficult student, um, that even the adults in the building were sort of almost encouraging Rashawn to give up on this kid. And it was it was in those conversations that Rashawn um, sort of understood the role that he had the opportunity to play. Uh, in many ways, this particular student thought Rashawn was much cooler than any of his teachers, so was willing to listen to him. Uh, and Rashawn really owned how important that was. Um, and understood that that meant he needed to, as he put it, step up his game, meaning he needed to be there. He needed to be a good role model. He needed to help Leonard take seriously the work that they had to do together. 
um, because he had an opportunity to do that in a different way than maybe any of the teachers could. So it's it's always exciting to see when our kids do that. But um, quite literally, I think teenagers often feel like they're getting told what to do a lot. Um, and one and that's something that Reach sort of prides itself on not doing. Um, but it's surprising to the teenagers sometimes. They, you know, when there's an issue at the, you know, when we have a new tutor and there's some sort of issue in a session, they often look to the adults in the room. And our response is often to look back at them and say, what should we do? Um, You know, you run this session. You guys are in charge here. How are we going to fix this? Uh, And that's sort of how they learn that idea of knowing they need to step up. They need to offer solutions. They need to fix um, or offer ideas to fix the, the challenges we face. Now, it's a powerful idea about taking responsibility for, for making a situation right. Uh, now, you talk about the tutors and the students, but who else is a part of your organization and what do they do? Um, so our, our program is school-based, meaning right now that we operate 10 different cohorts of tutors. So in each cohort, um, we have 15 to 25 tutors from a given high school that all go and work at the same elementary school. Uh, and in each of those cohorts is led by one or two program instructors. And those are um, staff members of REACH who are just exceptional relationship builders and coaches. Um, you know, we, we do train them in instructional delivery, so they are teaching some literacy content. Um, but we think the most important part of what they do is really around building relationships with the tutors and, and being mentors and, and sources of encouragement as well. Um, so those program instructors are at each of those sites. They lead training sessions and they supervise tutoring sessions and really help to build the culture that, that I've been talking about. Uh, and then we have our core full-time staff. So there are five of us now that are on Reach's full-time staff, um, Kim and Lindsay, who would do a great job supervising those program instructors and providing them with, you know, the support and and knowledge and guidance that they need. Um, Kelly is our program manager who makes sure that everyone has everything they need so that our program can run. Um, Lori designs our curriculum. All of our curriculum is built in-house because the model is unique. Um, And we, for every tutoring session we have, we also have to train the tutors on how to execute it. Um, So there's a there's an iterative process that is not something that existed in any available curriculum. So we, we do that all in house. Um, and then I, I get to hang out here too. Um, <laughs> and it, it often feels at this point that, that I'm just celebrating the good work done by my team. But, you know, as with any community-based nonprofit, a lot of my work is in the storytelling, is in the fundraising, it's in the, the management and development of the policies and procedures and plans that allow us to do this work. And, and we're in a stage right now where, there's such high demand for the work we're doing because we've been able to create some really positive outcomes that um, a lot of my work is about planning for growth and figuring out how we can bring this model to more young people in DC um, without losing what, what made it special in the first place. So uh, it's a great team uh, of this year, close to 20 people uh, that allow us to serve about 360 young people, 180 tutors, uh, slightly less than that in terms of the number of students. Um, but it's a whole team that really comes together and, and makes the work possible. And how many program instructors are there? We have 14 of them right now across our uh, 10 cohorts. So uh, depending on the size of the cohort, it's either one or two. Um, but it's it's an incredible group of people that often have other jobs. This is Our program instructor job is just a, it's a part-time after-school position. Uh, so the, these are often young professionals, uh, sometimes with experience in education, but often just with an interest in working with kids uh, and building community. And, and you know, if, if they bring the positive attitude and the interest in building authentic relationships, uh, we feel like we can bring pretty much everything else to allow them to be successful. Uh, so it's it's just an incredible group that um, that allows us to, to do what we do uh, by being supportive and authentic and caring and loving and, and allowing our kids to learn how to trust in, in themselves and in others. Wow, this is such a beautiful and well-thought-out thing you're doing. We, we need to take a quick break for a good news report, and we'll be right back after this. Tell us about the good news. This is Brianna Dinsher. Welcome to the Good News Report, where we deliver happy and exciting news from all around the world. 
Today's story is actually quite interesting and comes from Nampa, Idaho, where Kenton Lee opened up a nonprofit organization to help kids in Kenya who did not have shoes to wear. Initially, after working with barefooted children, he realized the importance of having well fitting shoes. He wondered, wouldn't it be great if there was a shoe that could adjust and expand so that kids always had a pair of shoes that fit? And his incredible innovation to this idea was a shoe that grows. Kenton started the organization, calling it Because International, and has since hand-delivered their first shipment of 100 shoes to little ones in Nairobi, Kenya. It can definitely be hard when living in poverty to keep up with constant growth spurts, and what Kenton is doing is absolutely amazing. His new shoe can now accommodate children's ever-growing feet by expanding up to five sizes, making them last to 10 years. He hopes to continue this in the future by giving more shoes to kids in need, giving them the chance to race wherever their hearts may desire. The reason I chose this story for this week is because it automatically stuck out to me for being absolutely remarkable. Not only has Kenton invented a shoe that grows with age to fit a growing child's foot, which is so interesting, but he's also giving away these shoes to kids who need them. He is doing it solely out of the goodness of his heart after witnessing himself what life without shoes is really like. Kenton is definitely using his kind voice and his kind heart to bring smiles to hundreds of faces, and that is absolutely beautiful. This week's quote of the week comes from Zoe Sayward. Don't wait for the perfect moment. Take the moment and make it perfect. Thank you all for listening to this report, and I hope it has inspired you today. Have a great rest of the week, everyone. Bye. A kind voice radio. And welcome back to a Kind Voice Radio. I'm David Levins. I'm here with Mark Hecker, and we're talking about Reach, an exciting program that's, that's creating all kinds of perfect moments. Mark, welcome back to the show. Thanks so much. Boy, boy, you're doing so many good things with this, and, and I think you touched on it earlier, but I'd like you to expand on some some of your tutors are now writing books that help them with the process. Can, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, so back in 2013, uh, a couple of my tutors uh, commented on uh, some of the books they were seeing in, in the libraries where we do some of our work at schools. And, and while there has been a lot of improvement in the last few years on the diversity of children's literature, it's it's still a significant problem that, you know, the large majority of children's book characters are white. Um, the, the stories that they tell don't often reflect the stories um, that my kids live. And so they, you know, it was really an offhanded comment at one point that one of our tutors said, I could write better books than this. Um, <laughs> and at Reach, we, we really believe that we are well served by letting our teens solve some of our most challenging challenges. Um, so what we, we did is we found a, a partner in Shout Mouse Press who really helps us with the writing process. Um, but we started writing new books aimed for the second and third grade kids we tutor. Um, and the books are lovely, colorful, well illustrated. We we partner with college students to do some of the illustrations. Um, but they also tell stories of, you know, One Lonely Camel is about Larry the Camel who loses his parents and therefore has to go move to a new zoo uh, and what it's like to be the new kid when you don't know anyone. Um, you know, Khalil's Swagtown Adventure is about a kid named Khalil who really struggles living in a house where his parents fight a lot. Um, and he sort of goes to this imaginary universe whenever his parents are fighting, and it helps to teach him how he can um, help his parents not fight as much as, as they do. Uh, we have The Princess of Fort Hill Shelter, which is about a young girl growing up in a shelter. And these are things that a lot of the kids we work with can, can relate to, and they're stories that they understand. Um, so they're, they're, they're places where kids can see themselves in books, which is what gets kids excited, excited about reading in, in the first place. Uh, what's even better is now, you know, four years later, we publish four or five books a year uh, with Shout and Mouse, and therefore we have 17 books now, and we often now go out and do author events. So our teenagers will go read at elementary schools or at libraries or at other community events, and it allows uh, young people in the community to see 
that that kid that they see in their building walking to his apartment is actually a published author um, and, and has created stories. And a lot of the time it really inspires our young readers to think differently about what is possible for them. Um, they're often really shocked to meet teenagers that are authors, and they're especially shocked to meet teenagers that went to their school or live on their street who are authors uh, and allows them to really imagine themselves as writers and creators. And it's been a, it's been a really positive experience, both for the authors and then um, watching the impact that they have in their communities. Wow, wow. You, you're really creating hope, and that's, that's like a whole ecosystem of stuff happening ba- based on these very, mm-hmm. very important stories the kids are writing about. Now, mm-hmm. when, you're, when you're setting up lesson plans, when the program instructors are setting up lesson plans, do you have like a whole library of different lesson plans, and do you tailor that for the specific situation of that student? So we we don't have uh, a whole library of lesson plans. We have a curriculum that provides, um, you know, our our program is 32 weeks long each school year, uh, and we do have lessons for each day. Um, what we do instead of actually creating different lessons for different kids is we actually teach our tutors how to alter lessons. Um, so, for example, we may have a lesson uh, that is sort of middle of the road in terms of difficulty. And as the year goes on, what we actually teach our tutors is here's the lesson you're doing today. When your student arrives, you're going to start working on this do now, this sort of warm up assignment. If they're really struggling with this, um, how do you think you could alter it to make it so it's still educational for them, but they can handle it? Uh, and alternatively, we, we help them to understand, you know, if your student finishes it in 10 seconds and clearly understands everything in it, uh, what's something you can do to, to challenge them a little bit to keep pushing on this topic? Um, so we, you know, I, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but instead of providing three different lessons for those three kids, we provide a lesson and then we start to train our tutors so that they, when given autonomy, can can make necessary changes uh, based on their students' need, because there, there's no one that ends up knowing the students' needs as well as the as the tutors that work with them every day. So not only do they know what topics are particularly challenging for their students, but they also know their kids' learning styles. They know if it's a kid that needs to move around or likes to play a game or likes to work alone or needs quiet. Um, but they can, we give them the autonomy and they, they end up feeling the confidence to make those changes to make sure the lesson fits the student. Interesting. And are the books the teenagers have written, are they integrated into your curriculum, some of them? They are. Um, it's something that's happening more and more. And our goal eventually is that our entire curriculum will be based on content created by the teens in our program. Um, it, they, it does pop up in there now and you see the characters from our books showing up in some of the lessons that our, that our students are doing. Um, but obviously, you know, obviously with four new books each year, uh, there's continued work to do to make sure they get fully integrated. Um, but yeah, it's, it's wonderful to be able to know that our, our teens are not just good tutors, but they're true content creators that, that can contribute to our curriculum and provide us with with the content that we need to to teach well. Now, it, it sounds like it's coming together in, in different ways. Now, if a teenager writes one book and you see the potential for a sequel, does sometimes another teenager write that sequel, or is it always a self-contained book? So to date, they've been almost entirely self-contained. Um, typically, our books are written in groups. So each book has three to four authors, and, and we do have authors – uh, the books actually get written during our summer program. So we, in each of the last four summers, we've written books. Um, and we have some teens uh, that have, uh, well, a number of teens that have been involved in more than one book. Um, there was only one group ever that actually did um, connect two books uh, in that we we had a book called The Hoodie Hero um, where DeMonte was the hoodie hero and part of the story is about him protecting or responding to a bully who was bullying his friend Jasmine. Uh, and then a year later, there's a book called Little Girl in a Big, Big World, uh, and the main character is Jasmine, who is really a secondary character in, in Hoodie Hero. And the stories aren't ne- – it's not necessarily a sequel um, in that it's not a continuation of the story, but it is building from one of the characters. So those those two books are connected in sort of a cool way. Um, 
but yeah, we don't give our teens any guidance on the stories. Um, so they get to write whatever they want. If at some point one of the groups was interested in creating a sequel, uh, I think we'd be open to that. Um, but really, we we give them the authority to write what they want. At this point, um, I think they've they've found different paths to follow. Very cool. Uh, so we need to take a pause for our final break of the day, and we'll be right back after this. This is NASCAR driver Kurt Busch, and I am proud to support our nation's veterans. Do you know you can get a faster decision on your disability compensation claims by filing an electronic fully developed claim, or e-claim, on e-benefits? Take it from a guy who lives his life in the fast lane. Faster is better. Visit ebenefits.va.gov today to learn more. There's nothing wrong with reaching out when you need I'll be there for you and maybe you can be for me With a kind voice, a few kind words An open ear for when you need to be heard A warm heart, we can make that choice to be a kind voice Hi, I'm Dominic Damaski, and I'd like to thank you for listening to Our Time Voice Radio. This is a place where we have conversations with an eclectic group of people who are using their time voices to help make our world a kinder, more connected place. If you'd like to add your time voice to the conversation, we are currently looking for new program hosts, producers, and bloggers. For more information, please check out the Using Your Kind Voice tab on our website, ourkindvoice.org. If you or someone you know happen to be creating a good story, we'd love to have you on our program. Please go to the radio menu at ourkindvoice.org and click on the show that best connects with your story. Then scroll down and click the guest information link. Thanks again for listening. And remember, please use your kind voice to make a difference and make somebody happy today. Kind Voice Radio. And welcome back. I'm David Levins. We're here talking with Mark Hecker about his organization, Reach. And we have the link to the website, Facebook page, Mark's TED Talk, Twitter, all in our show description. If so, if you want to learn more about the wonderful work Reach is doing. Mark, welcome back to the program. Thanks so much. Good deal. Now, you talked about one of the things you'd like to do is have your teenagers create a lot of the content for your curriculum. All of it, you said, is the ultimate goal. Now, are there other goals that your organization is striving for at the moment? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, one is, is growth in general. I think we, you know, Reach as an organization is only eight, about eight years old at this point. Um, and in the beginning, we were even though we experienced early success, um, we were very careful about how fast um, we grew at the beginning and how quickly we were willing to add new sites uh, because we cared so deeply about building the right culture and, and creating this, the strengths of the organization would be solid in the long term. Uh, I think we've now really entered our first uh, real growth stage. So, you know, in the last year, we've gone from serving about 230 young people uh, to about 360. And, and next year, we expect to serve about 500, um, which is just al- allowing us to bring this opportunity to, to many more people, uh, which is something that's exciting to me. I think um, the next sort of goal that is is most interesting and exciting to me is figuring out uh one, sort of how we can go deeper in specific school communities. So as I mentioned, we tend to go into schools and hire anywhere from 15 to 25 kids. Um, at some of our schools, we have a little bit more than that. But um, we're interested in exploring what would happen if we went much deeper. What would happen if we went into a single high school and hired 100 or 125 of their students as our tutors? Um, and, and I think that's an exciting goal for the organization to figure out how much could we move the needle for an entire school, uh, and then if we do that in enough schools, how much of a difference could we make in, in this city that we care about so much? Um, I think the other, the other thing that's interesting to me is really another issue of depth, uh, which is around how you know we have a long-term relationship with kids as they're in high school, uh, so therefore we're pretty uniquely positioned to help them in their transition after high school. And whether that is a transition to further education or the military or employment or other training programs, um, I'm interested in exploring how we can continue to support them uh, 
so that we make sure that they're successful in those transitions. So I think those, those are sort of the areas that we're looking at most now, um, and with the hope that in then five to ten years, uh, we can be thinking about how we can we can go even bigger. Wow, it's it's, it's very well thought out, and you want to get everything you do right. That's real obvious from mm-hmm. hearing, hearing you talk. Are there people in other cities taking elements of your model and, and applying it to what they do? Do you talk to other organizations? Yeah, so we have, we have. you know, I mentioned we're about eight years old, and probably for five of those years, uh, I've been fielding calls and emails from outside of D.C. for people interested in banding, interested in us teaching them how to do what we do, um, interested in just talking. And I think I'm I'm always happy to talk. I think it's important as educators and as people that are trying to improve communities that we be willing to, to share. Um, the goal is always to, to help as many young people as possible. Uh, at the same time, we're working hard to figure out um, how to do that teaching effectively. So at this point, um, we've sort of answered those calls and been happy to have informal conversations, but we haven't been willing to sell our curriculum or specifically train people in other cities just because I don't think we're ready yet. Um, and we're getting to the point now where I think our curriculum is getting close to ready. Uh, for a long time, it was something that was well used when people knew us and when those of us that wrote it were available to support them in its implementation. Um, but a professional curriculum has to be something that can be uh, implemented independently. And I think we're getting to that point now. Um, and we're really excited about what that means in terms of helping others. Uh, but to go back to, so I think there's a role we can play in in being evangelists for for this model. Um, but to the question you asked, we also are starting to see just elements of it getting picked up. Um, and not only does that sometimes mean just specific schools that we've run into, both in D.C. and outside, that, you know, for whatever reason don't or can't work with us directly, um, we're seeing people take their teenagers uh, and do some reading with local schools. We're, we're certainly seeing interest in, in some of the children's book writing, um, and we're seeing interest in some of the other things that we hold very dear, like running a program that doesn't kick kids out or being willing to talk about love and trust as key to educational outcomes. Um, so we certainly see that, and, and, you know, I have to run an organization, so I'm very aware of the fact that we want to be able to one day sell our curriculum and potentially some training support, um, but it's also a, a, a wonderful compliment to see that that people are starting to see the power of this model uh, and understand that teens really can thrive when, when given uh, additional responsibility for things that they care about. And, and I think at this moment, it's also worth noting that we did not invent this model. Cross-age tutoring has been around for a long time. What's, what's a little unique about what REACH does is the decision to hire the teens um, that are struggling academically. I think that makes us a little bit unique. Uh, and then I think we have a very strong organizational culture that's led to success. So we, we want to make sure that in any way that we help other people do what we do, that, that we are taking as seriously the culture as we are the curriculum and, and finding ways to, to help people achieve both. Uh, it sounds like you've got a very well thought out model, but it's, the core really is the execution of that model and, and how seriously you guys take it in. It, it seems that's what has made you successful. Is there one thing you learn doing this that really stands out among the other lessons? Um, I think one thing that I, I always like to point to is the fact that we very early on in our existence um, came to a very strong consensus around what our organization's values were going to be. Uh, and and that plays such a huge role in allowing us to make difficult decisions about execution. Um, you know, especially as you're growing an organization, there are, and you see this a lot, there are lots of opportunities to grow faster if you make, if you cut some corners in terms of some of the quality um, of what you do. And I think that because we care so deeply about the kids and have made very specific commitments to them in the way we define our core beliefs, um, cutting some of those corners was just never considered an option in some of that, those decision-making processes. Um, so I don't think we faced some of the drift that other organizations face sometimes um, because we were just so clear in, in what we had agreed to in terms of how we were going to treat the young people we served um, and, and the commitment we were going to make to them. So I think 
you know, often if in the world of social entrepreneurship, people talk about business plans and sustainability plans and work plans. And if you're focused on all that stuff and don't have a core belief statement, I think you're just, you're walking in the wrong direction. Um, and that's something that I think was really important for us. And the other thing I'll say that um, I hope that my staff would agree with this, but I think treating people well um, and honoring their work within an organization um, even after they're gone. So giving people the opportunity to understand the role that they've had in a kid's life um, and, and sort of funneling that feedback back to them, uh, allowing them to see the difference that they make, I, I think just creates a positive culture that, um, you know, when you feel cared about, then you can care about other people. So we have to do the first so that we can all do the second for the kids. Uh, and I think those two are, are key contributors to, to the success we've been able to achieve so far. It sounds like these core beliefs have created this very positive ecosystem that, that keeps getting better. After your students are done with the tutoring, do any of them continue on in a role in the organization? Uh, a couple have. So we have some that have started attending college in, in the city. They've stayed close to home. Uh, and at a couple of our sites, we have some assistant positions where they can help on tutoring days uh, by, by sort of helping with the classroom, providing additional support to tutors and things like that. And, and we have actually hired a couple alums uh, to come back and serve on staff in those roles. Um, because we're relatively young, our, our oldest kids are still in college now but there are a number of them that tell me that their plan is to come back and take my job, which I would love one day. <laughs> um, and I think there, there is, as people leave their formal connection to the organization when they graduate from high school and they may not be able to be tutors anymore, um, I do feel like we create a community where people still feel connected to the organization. And, and the way we see it now is actually more informally, where kids will come back and visit when they're home from college or they'll stay connected to us. Um, and, and we want to build that out in more formal ways as we grow, potentially not only through partnerships with some colleges, but with some employers where, you know, people that have been reach tutors for two, three, four years um, bring a maturity and a style of leadership that I think people would find valuable. And as we can formalize some of that, I think those, those relationships may continue in more formal ways as well. Well, wow, there's just so, so much you're doing and there's so much more potential as well. Now, you've covered a lot, but is there anything I haven't asked that you'd like to share with the audience before we close out? Um, I, you know, honestly, I've, uh, I get interviewed on a somewhat regular basis at, at this point, um, and I think you asked a lot of good questions. I think the one thing I'd just circle back to that I really appreciate that you did ask about is um, – what I really think makes REACH special is, is sort of that we flipped a key component of education on its head, that I think for a long time we've said to kids, if you act right, then we will treat you with kindness and respect and give you privileges and responsibilities. And I think what REACH does is just turn that over. We, we say we're going to treat you well and give you privileges and responsibilities and, and treat you as though you've already been a wonderful leader in your school community. Um, we just do that part first with the understanding that treating a kid in that way will create the positive behavior. Um, and that's all based on this component, this idea of trust. Um, that we need to build the trust first, and we know that all of our kids have the potential to be great leaders in their school communities. Um, so we start by treating them as though they already are, and then we watch as they sort of emerge as the people we know they're capable of being. So um, I think that's what makes me most proud of, of what we do and the young people we serve. Um, and I love that you sort of uh, zeroed in on that idea of trust and relationships and how important that is to what we do. Um, but I always want to make sure people hear me say that over and over because I think it's it's what makes us unique. Expectations are such a powerful thing, and, and this conversation definitely exceeded my expectations. I, I can't believe the hour is over already, but, but thank you so much for joining us, and, and good luck with everything. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed it, and I, uh, I was excited to be here today, so, so thank you for giving me the time. Good deal. Ha have a terrific day. You too. Thank you. And that was Mark Hecker telling his amazing, amazing story about REACH. And all the links are in our show description. So you definitely want to check out this amazing story because it's a living story that there are many ways that you can contribute to it. 
So this is David Levins. I, I want to thank Yolanda Riley for finding Mark and, and all the wonderful guests we've been having on. She she does a terrific job. And I want to thank our guest, Mark Hecker, for, for joining us today and, and ask you to go out and remember using your kind voice. Before we could use our kind voice, we have to have tolerance for people that are different from ourselves. It's It's a key element. So I hope you go out and use your kind voice to make a difference in the world that we all share. Have a terrific day, everybody. Hello, fellow soldier, how's your day? Come take my arm, let's walk in the sink away. Thoughts now, yes, it's true. And that blue bird, he flew by now just for you. Step outside, you don't know who you'll meet. Feel the bitter patter of the street. Join the crowd and sing in harmony. Let go, come link elbows with me. A friend.